Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, August edition of the Cancer Prevention and Wellness. We'll get started in a couple minutes. Jeff, I'm having trouble getting, hold up. Sorry, no give me just a moment. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Welcome everybody. It's uh, August in the upstate of South Carolina and it's still, if you've been out, very hot and very muggy. Uh, so uh, we know what time of the year it is. Uh, I'm Jeff Jaguer, your host uh, for the Cancer uh, Prevention and Wellness Series uh, presented by the Cancer Survivors Park Alliance. Um, each month we have a uh, topic um, that will help people uh, live hopefully a better life with or without a diagnosis of, of malignancy. Um, we talk about integrative and complementary <clears throat> um, medicine, as well as some prevention topics and uh, vaccines and um, you know prevention recommendations. Um, one of the things that I need to let you know is some certain housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, we will be muting everybody that's on the call. Um, that does not mean that uh, we do not want you to ask questions. Um, we really covet the questions. And um, so uh, if possible, if you can use the chat feature, I'll be monitoring that um, area uh, and we will um, put your uh, questions forward uh, to our speaker. The, the session is being recorded. Um, we find that a lot of our, our folks want to listen to it again or want to share it with their friends and family, and we really encourage that. Um, this recording will be available on the website of the Cancer Survivors Park. That's cancersurvivorspark, all one word, dot org. And um, all of our sessions, since we've been recording these, we are, are on, that, on that site, so you can go back and uh, listen to other topics that you might be interested in. Um, and um, tonight, I think we have a um, program that's that's widely applicable, applicable, and will have a wide appeal because um, um, most of our female population has to deal with this. Uh, we are real pleased to have with us Dr. Jonathan Bailey. Um, Dr. Bailey um, has been in Greenville uh, practicing OBGYN for a while. Um, he grew up in Danville, Kentucky, and um, had his first exposure to Greenville when he came undergraduate uh, for studies at Furman. Uh, he went back to Kentucky for medical school, uh, came back to North Carolina in Charlotte for his OBGYN um, residency. He's a fellow in the American College of OBGYN OBG uh, and uh, also as a member of the North American Menopausal Society and as a um, practitioner uh, for menopausal symptoms, uh, certified practitioner. Uh, so uh, I remember personally, um, Jonathan moved into our neighborhood uh, many years ago. Um, we knew he was from Kentucky because he was flying this big blue Kentucky flag. <laughs> is, is that still out there? Oh, yeah, I had to get a new one, though, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's not the same Kentucky flag, it's a new no, one. Uh, no, and right, he, had, right. he had two little kids that, um, you know, now he tells me one's uh, an undergraduate at Wofford, one's already graduated from college at Auburn, so um, although he still looks young enough to, to pledge a fraternity. 
Uh, but anyway, he's got a lot of expertise in this area and can talk about um, uh, menopause and all the symptoms and and uh, potential uh, therapeutic measures therein. So, uh, Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us, and I will let you take it over, and uh, we will uh, talk through things. And I'll monitor the chat room for questions, and and you guys know you can ask. Well, thanks, and, and Dr. Jaguar, thank you for having me. This is a it's an honor to talk to to you guys, and for hopefully for the folks who may listen down the road and the, for the folks who are listening tonight. I just am glad we can talk about some of these topics. Um, so menopause is sort of a, an issue that's become near and dear to me and, and one that I've uh, sort of made it a mission to learn more about in the last many years. And my goal tonight is to hopefully give everyone a brief summary of what menopause is, um, help to give a better understanding about symptoms uh, treatment options, potential risks associated with treatment options, and other medical issues that can surround the menopausal years and beyond. Uh, it's interesting. I, I find that menopause seems to be one of the somewhat contentious topics amongst different fields of medicine, and oftentimes one of the more poorly understood. It's. I feel like several times a week I speak with patients who have a preconceived notion about either symptoms or treatment or risks of treatment. And oftentimes they're misguided or just have been given, you know, incorrect information. So I hope that we can give um, good information out about what we know. And, and there's some things we don't know so well. So we'll go through some of that as well. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and start with uh, just a basic sort of what is menopause? And menopause is basically a time in a woman's life where her ovaries cease to ovulate, cease to, to function in, turn, in, that, in that regard. Um, diagnosing it is actually, it's a retrospective diagnosis, which means that to be menopausal, it's 12 consecutive months without a period um, in the proper clinical setting. Now, the reason that's important is that, you know, the average age of menopause is 52. Uh, and there's about a, which means, of course, half of people will do it before 52 and half after. Um, Any time before 40 is considered premature ovarian insufficiency. And from 45 to 50, it's considered to be early menopause. But the point about understanding the age and the way it's diagnosed is that um, it tends to come about in your 50s with the perimenopausal window, which is usually a three to five year window around that 12 month period of time where people will start to experience some symptoms. And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Um, define perimenopause uh, a little bit more. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like you go from uh, being 51 and having a year of normal periods to you wake up at 52 and right. suddenly you're, meno you're menopausal. Right. So what usually happens is in the years that precede the several three to five years that precede that actual 12 month window of no periods, people will, during that window of time, often begin to experience some menopausal symptoms, even though they're not technically defined as menopausal yet. They haven't reached that 12 month window yet. And for the sake of things, it might be a distinction without a difference because you're still treating a lot of the same symptoms. It's just they're not clearly menopausal yet. They're on their way. Okay. Uh, now, for most people, it occurs naturally uh, as part of the uh, all of our aging process, but it can also occur as a result of surgery. Uh, sometimes we'll operate on people who have, for example, severe endometriosis and need their ovaries removed or they may have a, a malignancy or a pre-malignancy of their ovaries and have to have them re removed. There are some medicines that can cause early menopause or early ovarian failure, one of which that comes up with the oncologist are some of their, for example, some of the chemotherapy agents can sometimes um, give the ovaries some problems. And um, also certain genetic predispositions. People can carry a predisposition to early menopause, as well as certain medical issues, um, some autoimmune issues, for example, can be associated 
with causing menopause earlier than what it would have naturally occurred. What's important to and note, I think though, we've done a, a, a much better job um, as oncologists in general medical terms of when we feel like we have to do something for an underlying malignancy. Now, usually if we're, we're doing a prophylactic oophorectomy for um, a, pre, a genetic predisposition like a BRCA or something like that, we do wait until they're finished with, with uh, child um, birth and that sort of thing. But um, we, we have kind of created a, a whole subspecialty about uh, for the, the patients that like Hodgkin's disease that are, that are occurring in younger people, um, you know, making sure that we um, put the ovaries to sleep, but also we're harvesting eggs uh, so that we uh, are not, um, you know, we're giving them the opportunity if their they're, if they're ovarian function doesn't come back uh, to still, you know, have the possibility of children. Absolutely, yes, you're right, and and our to your point, our advancement in egg freezing is is is, is been really uh, great, and yes, I, that that's something that has changed even in just in my time in practice, um, and so one of the, one of the reasons this topic is so important too is if if you reach the age of fifty, your average life expectancy as a woman is eighty three, so you will live up to your thirty year life. Uh, menopausal. So these things are important to understand. That's a that's a long time. We talk about symptoms, and this is where the perimenopause comes into place. What I typically see in patients is they'll come see me sometime in their late forties or early fifties for an annual visit, and they may mention or for a problem visit, and they may mention my periods have been kind of weird. Uh, one was six weeks apart. The next one came two weeks later, then it was a little bit off again, and I'm not sleeping that well, and I feel like I'm sweating a lot at night, and sometimes I get kind of flushed during the day, and if you press a little harder, they'll oftentimes say things like, my mood's not so great, you know, I just, I'm a little anxious, I'm a little down, I'm, I'm tired, um, and it's not always all of these things, of course, but those are sort of the cluster of symptoms that we begin to see in the run-up to menopause. And as you see hot flashes and night sweats, you'll see in 60 to 80% of people. And they can occur, um, you know, for an average of seven to 10 years total. And uh, for those few years in the perimenopause and for, you know, five to seven years during menopause, for most people, they do go away as you get older. Uh, it's rare to see people over 60, for example, still dealing with significant vasomotor symptoms as hot flashes or night sweats. A few small percent can be refractory, but most people it's resolved by that point. But that window of time can be fairly turbulent. Uh, we talk a bit about vaginal dryness. That tends to be a, a later presentation in menopause. You don't tend to see it in the early parts, but you can. And it is unfortunately a time where we see a little bit of weight gain. Um, and that's a tough one. I, uh, it's more frequently abdominal weight gain. Uh, there's a few things we'll talk about a little later that might help with that, but that can be a challenge. Um, our, our metabolisms change, and it's just, that's one of the things that we know comes up. So you put all these symptoms together, and um, it kind of defines misery for some lady. <laughs> it does. No, it truly does. And sometimes they bounced around and, and maybe one doctor started them on an antidepressant or one doctor started them on a sleep aid. And sometimes you tinker around the edges and you don't quite get to the origin of the problem to get someone better. So just as a, a totally um, unnecessary aside, um, hot flashes or hot flushes? Either one. It, it, people say them both. <laughs> I don't know. Even in your know. field, do, you haven't <laughs> yes. committed to one? We you mostly say hot flashes. We say hot flashes, but I'll hear lecturers say flushes sometimes. And yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's an IQ thing. Maybe if you're smarter, you say flushes. I don't know. But well, I think most flushes. say flashes. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, so then people oftentimes will ask me, well, how, how do I know if I'm menopausal or not? And that's a good question. 
It's usually just a clinical diagnosis. You don't necessarily have to draw lab work. And oftentimes, lab work is not all that helpful. It can definitely be helpful if you have someone who is a little young for menopause, that is, they don't quite fit the clinical criteria, if they may have other reasons to have irregular periods. So, for example, if someone you think hasn't been screened for a thyroid problem in a few years, it's always wise to check that. There's another hormone I noted here called prolactin, which is relatively uncommon to see a problem with at this point in life, but it can cause people to skip their periods. And so sometimes you'll rule out other things to make sure you're not missing something else. And then sometimes if you have someone where you can't follow their periods very well, either maybe they've had a hysterectomy, uh, maybe they have a progesterone IUD and they're not really having periods or they've had an endometrial ablation, sometimes blood levels can be a little more helpful since you don't have that period to guide you. If you do check labs, we'll check an FSH and an estradiol level. Once again, realizing during that perimenopause window, those hormones fluctuate. I see people not infrequently who'll say, a few months ago, my family doctor checked my lab work and told me I wasn't menopausal yet, and I was, I was you know, fine. We'll talk in a, a year or two. And you look and you hear their symptoms and you see their lab work and you'll say, you're correct, you're not menopausal yet but you're perimenopausal and these labs aren't real helpful in this setting because they move around a lot. I could check them every week and they would bounce around. So there are times we'll check them. They can be helpful in some of the situations that I mentioned, but normally you don't have to do it. And um, other labs that I will see people have that they have had checked, you'll see them go to some of these outside testing centers and get things like progesterone levels done, which are generally not clinically indicated or overly helpful. Sometimes they'll get testosterone levels checked, which are debatable on how helpful they are. And um, I'll also see a lot of salivary hormone levels being checked. And those are just not overly predictable or reliable and really are not written. NAMS, for example, North American Menopause Society does not recommend following or checking salivary hormone levels. So you can save your money on that one because they're not cheap. Right. Um, the, so, the other thing um, I can imagine, you know, obviously there are other symptoms besides a lack of period, but there's the scenario of a patient status post to hysterectomy. So they're not having periods. And, you know, you you might be more inclined to get lab confirmation uh, of menopause. Um, I know we Co had to correct because, you know, in, in treating um, breast cancer, there was the development of these aromatase inhibitors that are only yes. really uh, useful in postmenopausal ladies. So it was, it was necessary sometimes for us to confirm the lab levels like the FSH and the estradiol. Um, you know, that, that, that you really fell in that, in that range of postmenopause. Uh, Absolutely. There are, there are times it can be helpful for sure. And I, and I, I know the testosterone levels are a, a difficult assay. I mean, it requires a spec, you know, liquid chromatin. I, mean, I think they, they require going off to a special lab to get accuracy. Do, do you, use testosterone mainly in, in premenopausal women that are perhaps having some uh, sexual hypofunction? So that's a great question. Um, a couple things about testosterone levels. We don't have great parameters for what women should be short of we know what number they should not be over, for example. Um, so I don't normally check testosterone levels unless I'm following someone who I'm treating with testosterone. So to your point, um, there was, has been a lot of interest and in research into using testosterone for hypoactive sexual desire disorder, particularly in menopausal women. Um, unfortunately, the data has not been overwhelming. In the largest study that looked at it, they did show on average, women treated with testosterone had on average, one time more per month where they might initiate a sexual encounter uh, compared to the people not being treated. And so I, 
I'm not, I do do it sometimes. I, I always tell patients when I do it, I don't have a lot of data to tell me this is significantly likely to help you, but I don't have a problem doing it as long as we're following your levels and we're making sure we're not getting your levels too high. So I'll usually use a transdermal testosterone cream and yeah. I will check levels about every three months. And I've had, I, I kind of feel like my results have sort of mirrored the data. I've had a decent number of people that haven't really noticed much difference. And I've had an occasional person who think it helps. So I'm certainly not opposed to it by any means. I just, uh, it, it just hasn't really at this point in the way we've used it, it hasn't really panned out as, as significant a factor as we hoped it would be. That's great. Or thought, or thought it might be. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I think that's, that's a great answer. Uh, though, so we did have um, a question come in on chat. Uh, and, you know, obviously the perimenopausal, menopausal symptoms, there's a wide range, but um, they were asking about joint pain and loss of muscle mass as symptoms. Um, is that something <clears throat> that um, you can relate to? Or Yeah, some women will. Um, some women will. So the joint pain part of things we do think for some women has a progesterone component to it. And that they might be, they might benefit from hormone replacement therapy, though it's not technically a FDA approved indication, but yes, we do see some of that. And yes, muscle mass is something that um, throughout our life we need to try to maintain, but the degree of, of, of atrophy does speed up as we get older and um, hormone replacement therapy isn't going to do a whole lot significantly right. for muscle mass. Uh, but we know that um, that's something that women ought to be mindful of and work on and could in terms of their exercise as they get older. Yeah, um, there's a question about osteoporosis, but we're going to get into that. Yeah, uh, we'll in get we'll get to that. Excruciating um, detail here. <laughs> well, so the four indications that so so we'll start with treatment options, and I'll start with the the, the one that everyone wants to talk about usually, and that's hormone replacement therapy. Um, you'll see my abbreviation HRT, which is just hormone replacement therapy. Uh, so it's kind of the mainstay and the most effective option that we're going to get to other ones that work well also, but it's been approved for four things, treatment of hot flashes, osteoporosis prevention, treatment of vaginal atrophy, and treatment for people who have premature ovarian insufficiency, the folks we talked about earlier who go through menopause prior to the age of 40. A, a few things to set out that are important as we go forward. Um, there are two main ways or two two types of ways to get hormone replacement therapy. If you have a uterus still, if you're going to be on estrogen, you have to also be on progesterone because estrogen has a certain effect on the lining to your uterus and progesterone manages that effect and balances it out. If you don't take both and you have a uterus, that estrogen over time can cause your lining to your uterus to be overstimulated and that can be a risk factor for bleeding problems and even endometrial cancer. So if you have a uterus, you need to be on both. Um, now, Jonathan, will they have, is there a, a chance for sloughing when they do both? Yes. There's, well, there's two different ways we can start combination therapy. One is to take them, take each pill every day, uh, which is called continuous treatment. Or you can do what's called phasic treatment, which means you basically take the estrogen pill every day and you take progesterone for 10 to 12 days a month. The people who take phasic therapy will tend to have periods or light bleeding at the end of their 10 to 12 days of progesterone. Um, and we'll, we'll often use phasic therapy in early menopausal women until we get them evened out uh, in terms of their uh, menopause transition. So, yes, you can. Um, and I mentioned here uh, progesterone or a serum, and we'll get to where the serum is a little bit later, but a serum is what's called a selective estrogen receptor modulator, long phrase. Uh, the oncologists have used it called tamoxifen. Uh, if you've ever had infertility therapy, Clomid is, is a serum. Um, there's a newer, a relatively newer uh, hormone replacement therapy that uses a serum instead of progesterone to balance out estrogen's effect, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, if you if you don't have a uterus, you can use estrogen by itself. And there's some reasons to think that might be beneficial. Uh, and there's different ways to do it. You can take it orally. You can do it transdermal through a patch, a gel, a cream, a spray. 
Um, and there's even vaginal ways of doing it. And hormones come as in, in different uh, forms. There's natural, there's bioidentical, there's synthetic. Bioidentical has, has gotten to be somewhat associated synonymously with compounded hormones. And it's not, it, compounded hormones can be bioidentical, but there are commercially available, FDA approved, tested bioidentical hormones. For example, estrace is 17 beta estradiol. That's what your ovary makes. Prometrium is a progesterone. It's a micronized progesterone. It's what your ovary makes. Those are bioidentical and those are prescriptions and those are, so you don't have to go through a compounding pharmacy. And in some cases you want to be careful about doing that, but you can get bioidentical with a prescription. It doesn't have to be something special to go find that. And just for clarification, if you're using just vaginal estrogen and have a uterus, do you have to do the progesterone? If you're, there's two types of vaginal, well, there are vaginal estrogens made just for vaginal atrophy. That's right. uh, the vaginal creams, that's Vagifem, which is a pill. And there's a ring called Estring. All of those are local topically absorbed estrogens and you do not need to be on progesterone. There is one ring called Femring, which uh, gives you uh, systemic or whole body absorption of estrogen. With Femring, you would need to be on uh, progesterone if you had a uterus. So if there's absorption to the systemic system, you need to have a... a, a exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. There are some contraindications to hormone replacement therapy. I've listed a few here you can see, but certainly people with a history of a heart attack or a stroke, people who've had a pulmonary embolus or a deep venous thrombosis before, um, if they have a known hormone receptor positive cancer, um, unexplained bleeding, you can read those. But there are some things that are just a no-go for traditional hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and good, it's good things we'll talk about here in a little while. They're alternatives for those people. And as we discussed, so those are contraindications. But to talk about risk, there's two things, two simple things we need to lay out in, in terms of how to do that appropriately. One of them is, are you taking estrogen by itself because you don't have a uterus? Or are you taking estrogen plus progesterone because you do? Those two groups have subtle differences in risk. The second thing we need to consider is, what is your age? When are you starting the hormone replacement therapy? What I put in quotes there is the critical window hypothesis. That is the idea that treating women during the time period where they're mostly symptomatic, which is ages 45 through 60, tends to be that critical window where we see the lowest risk and the most benefit. And we'll get to that in a minute. So when did you start it? What was your age? And which preparation are you on? Are you on estrogen by itself or both? And the numbers I'm going to share with you, uh, the most recent largest study looking at risks of hormone replacement therapy called the WHI, it was, you don't care about the details most likely in terms of its history, but it, it was released initially without a lot of detail. Two years later, the detail came, which was very different than the original story. And so now we kind of have gone back and broken the numbers down to where it, we can give you numbers that matter to you individually. And so in their study, and the numbers I'm showing you here are people in that, in that critical window. That's people who are ages 50 to 60, roughly 45 to 60. And these risks are, are, are expressed as uh, uh, increased risk per 10,000 women. So let's talk about estrogen alone briefly. I'm not going to go through all of them, but for example, people on estrogen alone in that 50 to 60 year old age range did have an increased risk of about five more DVTs or three more pulmonary emboli per 10,000 women. That means a blood clot in your leg or a blood clot in your lung. Um, those numbers are a lot lower than the risks of those things on birth control pills or the risks of those things during pregnancy. But those are standard risks we see with hormone replacement therapy. Uh, but here's what's interesting. What about the decreased risk? What things can estrogen alone uh, decrease your risk for while you're taking it? And you'll see them here. And it's interesting, you know, uh, fewer cases of heart disease during that window of time, fewer strokes, um, fewer uh, diagnoses of all cancers, fewer breast cancer diagnoses, fewer diabetes diagnoses, and actually fewer deaths. That's during yeah. that window of time. 
It's interesting because, you know, uh, I'm obviously dating myself, but before the WHI, I mean, there was uh, a lot more people that were uh, espousing the, the increased risks of estrogen re um, replacement rather than, I mean, it, it this did show the benefits. Uh, it was really emphasized about heart disease, but all these um, decreased malignancies uh, are important too, so... It's, yeah. it's, and it's interesting. And once again, this is people that they followed during that window of treatment, right. but it's reassuring. It's reassuring. Um, mm -hmm. Now, when you add in progesterone, you see things change a tad. I mentioned it was a little bit different. Now, I want to be clear the progesterone that was used in this study is a synthetic progesterone. It's uh, if you've heard of Depo Provera, it's a pill lower dose form of that. We don't know if these same numbers would hold true for a bioidentical progesterone like prometrium or other or a serm but i can't say one way or the other so I, I you know we don't know but we at least know in this study when you added progesterone it changed things a little bit you had it and you can see it right there you had uh, a slight increased risk of heart disease five more per ten thousand you can see the breast cancer risk five more per ten thousand once again those are slightly increased risks, but they're very, very low. Um, and then you can see the decreased risks too. Once again, fractures, diabetes, all-cause death, um, colon, and other cancers. You can see the decreases there. So it's important to realize during that window of time where we're treating people, at least in this study, that this was using Primarin and Provera. And so I can't say other preparations are better or worse. Uh, but I think it's fair to say these numbers are at least reassuring when treating people who are in that critical window of time when they're most likely to have symptoms. Um, and I think that's important. We move on sort of to, well, what about long-term risk? Well, in this study, uh, the average length of treatment was about six to seven years, but they have followed people for up to 18 years now. So we have, these are people who have stopped it, but they were on it for an average of six to seven years. And you can see it's interesting. Um, those on estrogen alone had no increased risk of death from heart disease or breast cancer. In fact, they had a lower risk of death from breast cancer. Not entirely sure why, and maybe with the numbers being so small, maybe it's just incidental and not significant, but it is significant that they didn't have a higher risk, of course. And then you look at the estrogen progesterone group, and theirs was uh, no increase or decrease in mortality from cancer or heart disease. So... I think it's a, in both groups had lower rates of uh, all cause deaths compared to those who had never used hormone therapy. Point being, once again, I think it tells us that using hormone replacement therapy during that symptomatic window of time should not be something that we're overly scared of unless you have a contraindication like one of the ones we mentioned. Um, there are risks and benefits, and um, but I think I think it's important to note because I feel like there's been a lot of uh, misconception out there in the community. Breast cancer is the main one. That's the main one people want to talk about when they uh, talk about uh, hormone replacement therapy. When you go on, when you look at other studies that have looked at longer term use of hormone replacement therapy, that is, ten years or more, which some people will be on it looks like the accumulation of data would tell us that there is a slightly increased risk. It seems to be a risk increase that's similar to the risk increase in breast cancer of having two alcoholic drinks a day uh, or being obese. Uh, both of those have similar risks of breast cancer associated with them, as does longer term estrogen use. And so that is something to remember and the fact most people don't need to be on systemic estrogen long term. Um, a lot of folks will say, well, I can't be on hormone replacement therapy because my grandmother had cancer or my mother had cancer. Well, minus a true genetic predisposition like a BRCA carrier or other uh, genetic predispositions for breast cancer, it doesn't appear that family history alone confers uh, hormone replacement therapy confers a greater risk than family history uh, in those patients. And so that really is not a contraindication in those folks. Um, 
the questions about BRCA carriers, we do not have a lot of data on those folks. One observational study showed did not show an increased risk. A lot of these women will have uh, prophylactic mastectomies uh, a little later in life, which um, obviously uh, makes us feel more comfortable for sure about treating their menopausal symptoms. And many of them will have, of course, also have risk reduction ovarian removal at a younger age. And so I think you have to balance quality of life in these patients and talk to someone about you've had a risk reduction mastectomy, you've had a risk reduction oophorectomy or ovaries removed, and now you're 45 and you're not feeling great. And right. well, you're miserable. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, right. And I think that for the most part, all of us would be very comfortable treating that patient uh, and helping them get through that period of time. And so all that's meant to reassure folks, I think, that some of the things that we be- that some folks believe make them high risk don't necessarily make them high risk. But then again, there are some things we don't know entirely. And the BRC carrier, yes, we don't have a lot of data on that. We probably never will, quite frankly. Uh, it'll take a while for us to have much data. And it will likely be post-operative data from people who've had risk reduction surgeries already. So, uh, But it's interesting because I think it does... Uh, allay some anxiety for folks. Well, I think the take home message is that we just have to have this discussion about risk and benefit and we don't have to be on it long term. In fact, right. if somebody over the age of 65 is still on estrogen replacement. I mean, that's that's probably not the right decision. Right. Um, breast cancer survivors, that's where I lean on folks like Dr. Jagir and his colleagues and going back to stage, grade, years from diagnosis, receptor positivity. There's a lot to that. And that's truly a collaborative decision. And um, there's not a lot of data. And, and that's another one we probably will never have a lot of data on. But that's one where we talk with the oncologist and, and, and figure out where we go next. Uh, for a lot of those folks, though, we will try to maximize non-hormonal options. Uh, and for vaginal symptoms, maximize topical options that aren't systemic, that don't raise your uh, estrogen levels and pot- potentially cause um, issues with cancer survivors. Now, to your point earlier, Dr. Jagir, about uh, 65-year-olds, that's kind of where the critical window hypothesis comes into play. And and this is where the initial release of the WHI da- data scared people so much because the average age of their participant was 64. And when it first came out, all of us thought, you're starting 64-year-olds brand new on hormone replacement therapy. That sounds like a terrible idea. Um, until they broke them down by age groups, then we could actually figure out you know, where uh, things fell. But point is, after 10 years after a menopause, certainly in your 60s, uh, new starts are probably not a great idea and almost never indicated. And that's also a time where you can usually gradually bring people off or have them come off entirely of systemic estrogen and then just manage, manage vaginal sy- symptoms with uh, local therapy. Um, we touched on this a minute ago with the premature ovarian insufficiency. This is a little different group. Uh, they are folks who do go through menopause prior to the age of 40, be it once again, surgical or a genetic predisposition or autoimmune issues or medications or whatnot, they're a different group. And um, it really is recommended for those folks to be on a higher dose of hormone replacement therapy if they're not contraindicated for some reason until about the age of menopause. And to Dr. Jagir's comments earlier, if we know we're doing something to someone that has the potential to decrease their ovarian reserve or ovarian function, it's a time to talk about how to preserve eggs and how to preserve fertility down the road. And I think we talked about that a little bit. Uh, earlier. Other cancers that people ask about, endometrial cancer, um, as long as you're taking estrogen with progesterone, there's not an increased risk of endometrial cancer on hormone replacement therapy. And and people who had endometrial cancer can be on hormone replacement therapy if they need to be, except for some folks who have had more advanced stage uterine cancers or or uterine cancers that had hormonal cancer. receptor positivity, which is relatively uncommon, but it does happen. Uh, Same with ovarian cancer. 
uh, there's not really a, there's not a link necessarily with hormone replacement therapy and ovarian cancer. And in fact, we know that birth control pill use when you're younger can help decrease your lifelong risk for ovarian cancer. Once again, people who've had their ovaries removed uh, younger in life for a uh, atypical ovarian cancer c- can be on hormone replacement therapy, unless it's one of the rare ones that is hormone receptor positive. And of course, we would avoid it in those folks. This is an important one for people who are contraindicated uh, for hormone replacement therapy or just didn't like it or want to try something different. We do have uh, at least two, well, two FDA approved. One is called Brisdel, which is simply a low dose of Paxil. And it's been shown to decrease hot flashes somewhere in the 25, 45% range. They say up to 69%. That's a little optimistic. Uh, Similar medications as Paxil can help too. Effexor, Lexapro, Selexa, Pristique, those four. doesn't appear, for example, that Prozac, uh, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, doesn't appear that they help a whole lot with hot flashes. But the ones we see here, we will. I do use in patients sometimes. Effexor was one of the earlier ones we used. Um, and then with Paxil now, um, I will try that on folks. And it does seem to help. You'll know in about two weeks if it's going to help. And uh, it tends to be not as dramatic as hormone replacement therapy, but certainly a welcome help to someone who can't be on hormone replacement therapy. And then the newest one, and this is one where I think is going to be, it could has a potential to play a, an important role, is a new medicine called Vioza. It's a whole new category of treatment for hot flashes. Not quite as good in their studies as hormone replacement therapy, but it's almost certainly better than the Paxils and the Effexors of the world. Uh, it works in the brain in a kind of a unique way. You, you probably don't care about the details of that, but it, uh, uh, I think it's very promising, um, particularly for women who can't be on hormone replacement therapy. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the future holds with it. It's, it's relatively new. I mean, it's been out a couple of months, so we're but still it's learning FDA about approved it. approved and, and you can prescribe. Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so that's one to keep in the back of your mind um, for a lot of folks. I'm looking forward to having some experience with it. I only have a couple of people taking it currently, but I imagine that's going to change over time. Talk about osteoporosis. Uh, important to note that, uh, you know, you build your majority of your bone mass into your early 30s. And then from there, it just starts kind of creeping down. You know, it's like someone takes a little chunk out of your out of the brick wall every few years. And that pace does speed up with menopause. Um, and you can see the numbers here. It's very common. And, and it's one of those silent medical problems. You're not usually going to have any symptoms until you have a fracture. And menopausal women and are, are at risk for uh, uh, pathologic fracture and decreased bone strength. And it's an important thing. Uh, Lumbar fractures or fractures in your lower back can be painful. They can change your posture. They can change your gait. Uh, And then hip fractures, this is a sad statistic, but about 20% of women will not be alive a year after a hip fracture. It's a big deal. And about 25% will need long-term care. So it's important that we don't wait till someone has a fracture to address it. And so that's where screening for and um, uh, treatment options for prevention of osteoporosis are important. We talked a bit about how hormone replacement therapy helps protect bone density. And that's one important one uh, for a lot of people. Uh, But also don't forget about your calcium and vitamin D, which I guess we'll get to in the next slide. Risk factors we talked about or on here, of course, menopause, low body weight, So very thin people. Uh, If you have a family history of someone who's had a a first degree relative, basically your mother, who's had a hip fracture, smoking's a big one. Other medications like chronic steroid use that you'll see uh, for certain medical issues. And then, uh, you know, uh, some medications the oncologist will use like aromatase inhibitors can affect your bone mass as well. So how do we figure out who has weakened bones or who has actual osteoporosis? That's where a bone density scan comes in. We start those around age 65, but we'll sometimes start them as early as 60 or earlier if somebody has significant 
risk factors. We talked a bit about um, some of those a minute ago, but low body weight, and you can see the list there, but there are several things that may make you at increased risk prior to the age of 65, where you ought to consider getting a bone density scan early. We take the numbers from the scan uh, and can put them into a, a, an algorithm that gives you a 10-year risk of fracture. And based on what your 10-year risk of fracture, we'll talk to you about therapy options and treatment options. Um, the bone density scans we don't normally repeat, but every two to three years, bone metabolism slow. Uh, there's no reason to check it yearly. Uh, if we start somebody on medication that has a really low bone density, we might check it 18 months later, but we still try to get to about two years. And if you've had a normal one, we'll usually wait about three years to check the next one. How about uh, Medicare paying for um, intervals that are less than two or three years? They probably wouldn't without a diagnosis of okay. uh, severe osteoporosis of some sort. Um, that would be a challenge probably, and, and usually not clinically indicated, usually. Yeah. Uh, don't forget about your vitamin D. Nobody gets, an, well, not nobody. It seems that almost none of us get enough vitamin D, and it's important. Uh, and, and it's measured in international units. And I recommend people get at least 1,000 international units a day. Um, and even up to 2,000 a day is fine. Uh, it's also important for other hormonal activity, but it's really important for bone. Calcium, we've always known about, and people tend to get, you know, a decent bit in their diet, even if they don't have much dairy. And so you don't normally need to give yourself a ton extra. I usually tell people one 500 milligram supplement a day should be fine to add to your diet. Uh, and then with the vitamin D and um, once again, we individualize therapy based on your 10 year risk from the bone density scan. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine doesn't recommend a great deal of uh, supplemental vitamins, but vitamin D is the exception. <clears throat> right, right. And um, med treatment options now, There's, I'm not going to go through all of them, of course, but there, uh, there are monthly options. There's once a year options. Uh, there's even injectables for people with more um, significant uh, osteoporosis. Jonathan, there you go. And so last, I wanted to mention a bit about vaginal atrophy. Right. So we, we talked about a lot of the um, symptoms around initial menopause. And vaginal atrophy can be one of those, but it's usually something that comes a little bit later. And it's usually something that gradually occurs. Uh, you'll see it in people. Oftentimes, too, they've, had, they've been on their hormones for a few years for um, – hot flashes and things, and they're ready to come off, and they come off, and they're doing fine in that standpoint. And then they come see you the next year, and they say, I'm having dryness. Um, sexual intercourse is uncomfortable. And uh, I always tell people, don't, if you notice that, don't wait to call me. Go ahead and call me now so we can get started sooner rather than later. This one, and you can also see vaginal changes. Uh, Dr. Jagir and I were talking about this earlier this week. You know, we forget about a little bit about the people who have pelvic radiation, which can affect your vaginal lining. And then, and, and also certain um, uh, chemotherapeutic agents for breast cancer can, can lower those estrogen levels and affect your vaginal lining. Good news is we generally feel pretty darn comfortable with, with topical estrogens to treat vaginal atrophy. It seems, and once again, this is where I will lean on my oncology friends to tell me when they don't like the idea, but almost always even in, you know, in breast cancer survivors, and they almost always are pretty comfortable with a topical vaginal estrogen cream. Um, we know that the systemic absorption of estrogen from those is uh, really only present much the first couple of weeks. After that, you take a woman who you measure her estrogen levels before you start vaginal estrogen. Then you measure them two months later, they're going to look the same. Um, if you check it two weeks in, you might see a quick little bump, uh, but then it, it comes down and, 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 and it's still negligible. Now, I, I do think uh, Dr. Jagir would probably say there are some folks, they still wouldn't be comfortable with doing that. And I told them that's where I would work with them and make sure they're, they may say, hey, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be okay with that down the road. 
but we're not there yet with her, for example. And that's just where we have to talk to one another. Uh, there's also a new oral pill called Osfina. I mentioned a CIRM earlier, and Osfina, CIRM just stands for a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And you can think of Osfina as a molecule that acts like estrogen in some parts of your body, but doesn't act like estrogen at all, or even the opposite of estrogen in other parts of your body. So Osfina is an oral pill you take every day, and it acts like estrogen on the, on the, on the vaginal lining, but doesn't really act like estrogen anywhere else. In fact, about 15% of people on, on Osfina will have new onset of some hot flashes. So it's kind of interesting. Um, we don't, I don't know, um, I don't think we really have, it's not really recommended in people who have had a history of breast cancer because I don't think we really know enough about it yet in that group. But it is a fine treatment for vaginal atrophy that we use uh, not infrequently. It takes a few weeks to see an effect. Um, you should tell people by four to six weeks, you should be noticing a difference. By three months, you hit your peak effect. And then if you stop it, you're going to gradually go back to where you were. Um, and so uh, that's one of the things to remember with that. And there are numerous lubricants. And I know the cancer survivors uh, group has a pretty, um, not pretty, very active and robust uh, survivors group for sexual functioning. And um, I'll make referrals there not infrequently. And we were talking about that uh, earlier this week as well. And so there are folks out there in clinics out there that designed just simply to help people who are dealing with significant vaginal symptoms post-surgery or post-radiation or post-chemotherapy. Uh, so there's help out there in, in all kinds of ways in our community. That's a good thing. And I think that's about all I have. Well, I, I made a mistake. I thought you had another uh, slide about the, the therapy for osteoporosis, osteopenia, and I took you off that slide a little prematurely. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, but, uh, so, you know, the, the Thosomaxes and um, yes. other things that, you know, mentioned something about that for our audience. Yeah, yeah so bone, uh, the way bone develops is you have certain cells that build bone and certain cells that break down bone. And they balance each other out to help keep your bones strong. Our earliest um, osteoporosis drugs all inhibited those cells that break down bone so that the cells that build bone can have a little bit of a head start. And those are called anti-resorptive agents. There are things like Fosamax um, and, oh, well, what's the one? Uh, Beniva. Uh, those are the two main ones, Foxamax and Beniva. There's also a once a year IV injection of those two medications that you can use as well. And those are what we call anti-resorptive. Uh, and they, once again, slow down the breakdown of bones so the bone building cells can get to work more. Uh, we, we usually use those for five or six years. And then we oftentimes take a, a quote drug holiday. Um, we found out over time that they do see, tend to build bone strength initially. But over the long haul, if you use them too long consecutively, you can start building bone that's not as good, kind of weird, uh, somewhat fragile bone. Wow. So oftentimes I'll get a response. I'll treat people for five or six years and then I'll stop. And then I will um, repeat their DEXA scan a couple years later. And if they're kind of holding steady, leave them be for a while. But if they start dropping again, we can start them back on it again. Um, or we can start something that's not an anti-resorptive agent. Um, and there are a few of those out there as well. A Vista is one that um, helps those cells that are that are helping to grow bone. That's also a CIRM like we talked about. And then there's some that act the other way. They stimulate the, the cells that are growing bone. Prolia is one that comes to mind. And it's what's, uh, it's, it's, it's an anabolic agent. That means it's basically stimulating your bone growth. Uh, um, it's like a, it's an, too. Yes, yes, right, exactly. And so... Um, there's several different ones of those now, and we do use those some. We don't usually, that's usually not our first line for osteoporosis. We use it for severe osteoporosis, and we use it for people who um, are refractory to the Fosamaxes of the world or who have side effects from the Fosamaxes of the world and can't take them anymore. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. No, that, that was um, a wonderful uh, lecture about a lot of important topics. 
Um, we will send this out, the recorded version, to um, our email serve list. And um, those folks that are on the call, if they could uh, they could feel comfortable sending it to their friends and, and people that uh, might gain benefit. You've basically got uh, here a um, uh, an opinion from a specialist that you will not be billed for. Um, so <laughs> all right, all good. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Dr. Bailey referred to was the uh, uh, the psychosocial, psychosexual uh, things. I mean, after chemotherapy, pelvic radiation, some GYN on oncology surgeries, uh, there can be um, a lot of uh, libido issues, um, uh, how people feel about themselves issues. Uh, and so there is an appointment uh, within the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship called the SHE appointment, which is a sexual health evaluation. Uh, we have two nurse practitioners that um, have really kind of uh, focused their reading and their uh, expertise towards uh, helping them with, with some of these solutions. Uh, as well as giving them some counseling. I know St. Francis has a, a psychosexual counselor as well. Uh, so there is help out there. Uh, I have one other question in the, the chat. Uh, what is your opinion of the use of phytoestrogens, namely say soy uh, intake as an alternative to HRT? So uh, there have been numerous things through the years from soy products to black cohosh. Um, there's there's several other different herbal, all sorts of things out there that um, had good theory behind them, or at least had, you know, promising theory behind them. The problem is, and, and is that when these have been put to the test and studied, the phytoestrogens are, are, are an example of this. When they've actually been put to clinical tests and studied, they haven't really shown to be all that beneficial. Um, what I tell patients is, if you're taking it and try it and you feel like it's helping you, fantastic. You can run with it. I'm comfortable with it. Uh, but the data behind its benefit is uh, not particularly robust. And so I don't normally um, start people on it and recommend them do it. But if they do it or want to do it, no problem at all. Try it and see, you know. Uh, just because data doesn't show it works in a big group doesn't mean it may not work for any individual person. So um, I, I don't know that the efficacy is there, but don't have a problem with it. From the other side of that equation, uh, <clears throat> there was always the concern that soy products might be causing estrogen to go up in patients who had hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And that is not <clears throat> an issue. Uh, so I don't think it works for estrogen effectiveness, nor is it a risk factor if you're if you're dealing with hormone receptor positive uh, breast cancer. Um, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for all yes, sir. all together. Uh, I think it was all inclusive and it'll be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, I want to advertise um, in September on the 14th exactly, uh, Dr. or Carrie Susco, who's a licensed uh, medical social worker at uh, Prisma. And also um, uh, the director, she's a clinical psychologist and the director of our cancer uh, support community and a liaison with the cancer support community at the Cancer Survivors Park is going to talk about um, living with uncertainty, which uh, certainly this group uh, has to deal with. Um, so um, I, I also um, want to end with a, a couple of quotes. Uh, one is not necessarily attributed to anybody, but somebody must have said it. But um, And this is the two most important days of your life, the day you were born, the day you find out why. And then uh, Albert Einstein, who is very quotable, um, is quite the philosopher, obviously tried to uh, put science uh, into the creation of the universe and um, and, and try to figure it out with equations, but still was always in awe of the process of what has happened here. Um, but he said, life is like riding a bicycle. In order to keep your balance, you have to keep moving. And if you keep moving, maybe you'll find why you were born. So anyway, um, I hope that you uh, uh, can disseminate this information to other people. Uh, and Dr. Bailey, thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate it.